Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today titled Employment Supports and Benefits Planning for SOAR Beneficiaries. My name is Pam Hines, Senior Project Associate with the SOAR TA Center, and I will be your moderator today. So before we begin, just a few housekeeping items to review. There we go. So a quick disclaimer, uh, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration, or the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you. Um, so some webinar instructions. As a reminder, your lines will be muted throughout the entire webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for download on the SOAR website in about one week. There are a couple of ways you can download the PowerPoint slides and other handouts. Um, one is to go to the chat box. We'll have a link uh, to the slides there. You can also go to the SOAR website um, at www.soarworks.samhsa.gov. Um, you can get the slides also on our uh, website too. So you can get them that way. As you can see, we also have live captioning and ASL uh, interpretation, thank you. And you can utilize that by clicking the closed caption button at the uh, bottom of the screen too. And again, at the end of the uh, uh, webinar, we will take some Q&A. Um, you'll be able to uh, put some comments and questions in that Q&A box uh, that you see uh, below. So we'll be um, leaving some time for uh, questions at the end. We also have an evaluation that we're, we ask that you kindly complete. It helps inform future webinar uh, topics as well. Um, Susie, can you help me change the slide? For some reason, I'm not able to forward. Great, thank you. Um, so purpose and objective. So it is really our intention that by the end of this webinar, you'll have a better understanding of how to utilize in your communities and within your agencies uh, benefits planning uh, for individuals uh, returning to work or trying on work for the first time and understanding what is uh, individualized placement and support, what is this supported employment and how can you utilize this uh, supportive services to help individuals um, return to work. Um, and again, how to access these, um, you know, these supports within your uh, community as well. And we'll be sharing a, a lot of resources created by the SAMHSA TA Center and some other resources um, around the country and in your communities as well. Uh, next slide, please. So to reach those objectives, we have some wonderful uh, panelists today. Um, Lindsay Horn, who unfortunately is not able to present, um, had a big hand in creating um, some of the slides uh, that our next presenter, Lindsay Weber uh, from Oklahoma, um, a SOAR trained case manager, as well as an IPS employment specialist uh, from Oklahoma Grand Lake Mental Health Center, who will really um, talk about how to implement um, IPS uh, within your area and talk about the principles of what is uh, IPS supported employment. And we're really lucky to have uh, Kirsten Silver and Takia Blackman, uh, both with the Maryland Benefits Counseling Network um, in Maryland, who will really talk about um, in more depth um, benefits planning and giving a perspective on how um, really uh, benefits planning can really help folks understand, um, you know, returning uh, to work as well. And then we will leave uh, time for Q&A. Next slide, please. So we're really fortunate to have Asha Stanley from SAMHSA to do our welcome today. Asha? Thank you, Pam. And warm welcome to all of you joining us today. On behalf of SAMHSA, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, Employment Supports and Benefits Planning for SOAR Beneficiaries. October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. 
The SAMHSA SOAR Tier Center is proud to promote employment for SSI, SSDI beneficiaries. Today's webinar will give you many practical tips and tools to help you better understand how to assist SOAR beneficiaries with accessing employment resources. I like to welcome and thank our presenters for your willingness to share your expertise with us. I will turn it back over to Pam Hain, who will be moderating today's webinar. Thanks again, Asha, for your uh, warm welcome. Well, now uh, joining us will be Lindsay Weber uh, from Oklahoma, who's gonna kick things off for us. And we'll uh, wait for Lindsay, I'll give her some time to uh, get her camera turned on to get situated. And Lindsay, if you need support with changing slides, um, we can do that for you at the TA Center. Okay. Can you guys see my video? Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Lindsay Weber. I work for Grand Lake Mental Health Center in Ponca City, Oklahoma, and it won't let me control the slides either, just by the way. And um, Grand Lakes is a community mental health center and we operate in um, 11 different counties uh, in mostly North, Northeast Oklahoma, but um, we're kind of spread into North Central Oklahoma and that's where I am. Um, we provide services allowing for consumers to op optimize their personal, social and vocational competency in order to live successfully in the community. Um, we help people with serious psychiatric disabilities function with success and satisfaction in their environments um, with the least amount of professional intervention as possible. So we work with community integration services to benefit consumers by optimizing their potential for occupational achievement, goal setting, skill development, and increased quality of life through education, training, and support to improve their mental health and promote lifestyle change and recovery. Um, we have a recovery orientation, including recovery-oriented treatment plans, individual, individual goal settings, and a staff philosophy of recover, recovery that permeates all service elements and activities. Next slide. Um, we operate um, individual placements and supports. We'll call that IPS. Um, so I'm on the IPS team and I'm an employment specialist for Grand Lake. And um, we offer supported employment and it's a program that helps people with mental illness and or substance abuse disorders find and keep jobs while at the same time providing employers with access to motivated employees. So half of IPS is um, working with em employees, with clients, um, assisting them with figuring out what it is that they wanna do. Um, it's very client driven, it's what their interests are. We wanna find something that they're going to feel invested in. Um, and the other half of our job is going out into the community and building relationships with employers. Um, we market IPS to employers as a way to um, fill gaps in their workforce and to provide support, supported employees. So um, depending on, you know, what the client wants and how much disclosure the client is interested in, we continue to work with the employer and the employee after they're employed to make sure that the transition into employment goes smoothly and that employment can be maintained. Um, next slide. So IPS is a highly successful evidence-based model of supported employment that promotes a recovery through work philosophy where individuals with severe and persistent mental illness and co-occurring disabilities achieve comp competitive integrated employment services when assisted with ongoing support services. So when we say recovery through work, I think it's an important thing to realize that where IPS, is the model works as they recover through work, not that work, that they have to be recovered to work. So that's gonna, whenever we go through the principles of IPS, that's gonna come up over and over again, but we are working with clients when they feel like they're ready to set employment or education goals. And so when they feel like they're ready, they don't, there are no, no exclusion criteria. Um, and then we continue to work with them um, 
ongoing after employment. IPS is the most researched and best described model of supported employment. And um, because it's evidence-based, there are um, several tenets of fidelity that we have that each program meets. Um, next slide. Um, one important part of IPS is that it's very client driven. So we, we ask the client, what do they want? Do they want to further their education? Do they want to pursue work? Do they want to build a career? Um, what kind of life do they want to live? Those are all very important things that we want to know so that whenever we're guiding them and bringing them job leads and bringing up ideas that we can give them something that they're gonna feel invested in, something that they have chosen. This is, we don't place people anywhere. Um, so for example, I, we have a client that wants to work at a fish, fish hatchery. Um, and that, that's, what, that's what he's passionate about. That's what he's interested in. And so, you know, that's the direction that, that we've gone. And we may not be able to find him a job specifically at a fish hatchery, but we're gonna find him something, you know, science-based or wildlife-based, something that he, he feels, we're gonna take all of those leads to him and he's gonna decide where it is that, that he wants to apply and invest his efforts. Next slide. So IPS is based on eight key principles. Um, zero exclusion, worker preferences, time unlimited supports, benefits planning, integrated services, a rapid job search, and competitive employment and systematic job development. And we'll go over what each of those things mean. On the next slide, we'll start with zero exclusion. So zero exclusions means that people are not excluded on the basis of readiness, diagnosis, symptoms, substance abuse history, psychiatric hospitalizations, homelessness, level of disability, or legal system involvement. We, we do not exclude anybody. When somebody says that they're ready for supported employment, we're there to step in. Um, so sometimes that makes things a little bit complicated, but we don't wanna turn anybody away that's willing to work. Um, so any, any client of Grand Lake Mental Health qualifies for IPS services in our area, and we don't turn anybody away. Next slide. Um, the next is worker preferences. IPS program services are based on the job seekers' preferences and choices, not our employment specialists or supervisors' judgments. So um, oftentimes um, we'll get clients who have like a significant criminal history or a drug history that, you know, shows whenever that people do a background check and they want to work in a pharmacy. Well, that's probably not very likely. That's not something that, but we don't, we don't discourage them. We try to find alternative solutions to still get them where they want to be. Um, next slide. Um, time unlimited supports. Job supports are individualized and continue for as long as the worker wants and needs the support. I followed my, my one, one of my most recent clients, I followed for a year and a half. After he had found employment, he had maintained employment and he had developed a relationship with his supervisor where he could work through issues that came up more effectively than he could previously. And I just continued with him until he felt comfortable that he could do it without somebody, you know, to bounce things off of. Um, and so we have face-to-face -face with, with each client, face-to-face -face contact at least monthly. Um, with the pandemic, that's been a little bit difficult. Uh, Grand Lake is really lucky that we have a strong telemedicine program in place prior to the pandemic. Um, and so we were able to maintain uh, contact with each client has an iPad with Grand Lake. So over the iPad, um, we had, you know, different telemedicine options. Um, so even when we couldn't meet face-to-face -face monthly, we still got to see each other. Um, but for most clients, we see them weekly on our team. Next slide. 
employment specialists help people obtain personalized, understandable, and accurate information about their Social Security, Medicaid, and other government benefits. Um, I'm a CWIC 50% of the time on the IPS team, a work incentives benefits planner, and the other 50% of the time I'm an employment specialist. So um, each client on the IPS team has benefit planning services available to them. And later on in my presentation, I'll kind of go over a story of before we had that and why we realized that that was something that was missing from our team and, um, and how we provide that service. Next slide. IPS principle number five is integrated services. So IPS programs are integrated with our mental health treatment teams. Um, at least monthly, each of our clients on the IPS team are staffed with their mental health team. So we will go to their mental health staffing, um, attend and make sure that we not only staff the client and the client's needs with their mental health treatment team, but also participate in the staffing to see if there are employment related issues for other clients that may benefit from IPS services. Um, most employment specialists are attached to one or two mental health treatment teams and discuss their caseload. Next slide. Um, IPS principle number six is a rapid job search. So we use a rapid job search approach to help job seekers obtain jobs rather than assessments, training, and counseling. The first face-to-face -face contact with employers occurs within 30 days. So we don't wanna spend an awful lot of time doing assessments right at the beginning because oftentimes our clients are in a hurry um, and, and they're ready to start looking for employment. So we try to minimize the amount of time we spend doing assessments right in the beginning and work on just following up on job leads, just figuring out what their needs are, just figuring out what it is that they want and providing you know, the leads that they need. Next slide. And IPS principle number seven is competitive employment. So we're not looking for um, like sheltered workshops, um, things that we're looking for jobs that anybody can apply, apply for that pay at least minimum wage, where our clients will make the same pay as coworkers with similar duties and no artificial time limits imposed by the social service agency. So, um, we want our clients to be employed in the community and jobs that are available to anybody at the same pay rate. Next slide. Um, IPS principle number eight is systematic job development. We systematically visit employers. Um, we select employers based on the job seekers preferences. Um, and we learn about the employer's business needs and hiring preferences. So I can say right now, for example, I have a client who is interested in um, office work as a receptionist or secretary. She has minimal experience, but she has some training. And so what I've done is gone through and found job leads in my community that are office related and gone to those employers and asked, what's their application process like? What kind of experience and education are you looking for? What is an ideal candidate for you know, these posted positions look like? Um, what's the best way to apply? Who's in charge of hiring? I wanna know all of those things. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and, <coughs> oh, okay. And the goal is to build a relationship with the employer so that they know who we are. They know the service that we provide so that later, if they have a position and they think, you know, that they're having trouble fill, filling or that, you know, they need filled quickly, that they think, you know, well, maybe, maybe IPS at Grand Lake, maybe they have somebody that's interested in that. So we wanna build that relationship with the employer, continue to visit with the employer. Um, next slide. Um, IPS specialists are there for the long haul. Um, so we aren't gonna, somebody isn't gonna be disqualified from the IPS program if they relapse. Somebody's not going to be disqualified from the IPS program if their symptoms worsen. 
what we're going to do is we're going to staff with their mental health team. We're going to discuss what we're seeing. We're going to discuss how with the treatment team, how that's affecting their employment. We're going to make sure that the therapist and the, the medical providers all understand what it is that we're seeing and, you know, provide services based on where the individual is. Um, so like, it's, it's a long road with some of them. You know, I've, I've been with the agency for several years and there are clients that I've had for two, two and a half years. It's been a bumpy road, but when we don't give up, when they know that we're not gonna give up and that, um, you know, they're always gonna have that support there as long as they want it, then I really do think that it benefits, benefits our IPS clients. Next slide, please. Um, the effects of unemployment in education is uh, increased substance abuse, increased psychiatric symptoms, reduced self-esteem and alienation. I think that with a lot of my clients, the thing that I notice the most once they become employed is their sense of belonging to the community, their sense of connection with the outside world um, really assists them in their recovery. It really is a game changer. Next slide. Um, the benefits of working or getting education is they have increased income, which is always a huge relief, improved self-esteem, increased social and quality of life, better control of symptoms, reduced substance abuse, and reduced hospitalizations. Next slide. Um, so it, IPS, all boils down to the original question, which is what do you want? Um, I have a client who's 50, who got his GED when he was 18 and he's never returned to college and, and that's what he wants to do. Um, and I've seen him blossom as a student um, and really like learn about things that he's passionate about. And I just think that that's awesome. And, and that connection to the community has really built his self-esteem, which just benefits his recovery in so many ways. Um, you know, but I also have clients who are like, I just want a job. I just want a job. I don't even care what kind of job. I just want a job. And they get a job cleaning motel rooms and they're perfectly happy. And they learn, they get new connections to the community and, you know, they, it makes them feel valuable and, and needed. And, you know, and that's what they wanted that that's where they wanted to be. So, you know, it's not always some big grand goal. Um, Sometimes they just want a little job and they want to be able to do that and they need support to do that. So IPS is, is there to provide support for, for any of the paths that clients would want to take. Next slide. Um, questions we ask in, in Oklahoma, we have several agencies that provide IPS services, 12 and 12, which is an inpatient um, drug and alcohol treatment facility. Um, Family and Children's Services, Hope, North Care, um, the Mental Health Association, Grand Lake Mental Health, and Red Rock Behavioral Health Services. Those are all agencies in, um, in Oklahoma that provide IPS services. And there are IPS teams at several of these other locations. Lighthouse and Catalyst are both inpatient facilities, but Northwest Center for Behavioral Health is also a community mental health center like Grand Lake. Next slide. Why do they recommend the IPS model of support? For one, it's completely free. Two, it's evidence-based. Um, over 65% of individuals with serious mental illness want to work. Participants in IPS are nearly twice as likely to keep their job. There are less hospitalizations. There are no evidence of negative effects from the IPS model. IPS is effective with a wide variety of issues, serious mental illness, substance abuse disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, first episode, episode psychosis, homelessness and legal system involvement. IPS is truly working is recovery, not you have to be recovered to work. Next slide. Um, so we've successfully implemented an IPS team with Grand Lake Mental Health. Um, we implemented IPS with individuals experiencing homelessness with mental health and co-occurring disorders. Um, so 
we have worked very tirelessly at Grand Lake to implement the SOAR program throughout our community mental health center. So in each of our clinics, there is at least one staff member who is SOAR certified to help with SOAR applications. And, and we have members on our IPS team who are SOAR certified to help with, with SOAR services for clients who are interested in work. Um, and I offer benefits planning services to each member of the IPS team or each client of the IPS team. So um, every single client that receives IPS services is referred for benefits planning now wasn't always that way. Um, I, I was gonna share a story about, I was an employment specialist before I got my C-Work certification. And I had a client who had two little kids and she hadn't worked in several years and um, housing had gotten her an apartment and she said she wanted to work. So I jumped right in and um, helped her secure a job. She got a job um, at online grocery pickup at our local Walmart and she loved it. She did very well. She got her first paycheck and it was uh, four or $500 for two weeks. Um, she had managed to find daycare for her kids and, you know, things were going well. She loved being employed again. And then she turned her first paycheck stub into her landlord for HUD, for HUD housing. She was, she was living in income-based housing and they said her rent was going to go up to $600 a month. And she got exceptionally discouraged. She's like, I'm not going to be gaining anything by being, by working. I'm, I'm going to have to pay everything that I earn from working and rent and daycare. And so it's easier just to stay home and not do it. And so she not only quit her job, she quit IPS completely. And I think if we would have been working harder on benefits planning and approaching those topics with clients before work, that we could have kept her engaged, we could have found her a job that she could still get the benefits of work and not lose any bene financial benefit from working, um, you know, making her rent. I, and I don't blame her for panicking. I would have panicked the same way as a single mother. So, um, you know, we've changed the way that we do things. Now I'm a benefits planner and, and each client before work is referred to me and we make an individual benefits analysis for each client. So I think that that's something that's unique to Grand Lake that we've implemented and it's working really well within our agency. Next slide. That's it. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And especially thanks for sharing your lessons learned um, about how to approach um, applicants, uh, beneficiaries, um, to help them understand how benefits could impact housing, uh, for example. So thanks for sharing that, because I think that can really help other um, store train case managers who are doing this work to avoid um, that dilemma as well. So thanks again. Now we're moving on to Kirsten Silver in Maryland, who's gonna share, go more into depth about um, benefits planning and some of those SSA work incentives. Um, Kirsten, thank you. No problem. So um, I hope everybody, can you hear me, Pam? Am I good on voice? Oh, awesome. Okay, so um, my name is Kirsten Silver. I am the Director of Self-Sufficiency and Education with the Maryland Employment Network and the Maryland Benefits Counseling Network. Um, I wanted to start off by saying that I loved Lindsay's presentation. Uh, I actually started as a benefits counselor in an IPS program as well. Um, so I'm a little bit biased <laughs> in terms of the effectiveness of IPS and the importance of benefits planning. Um, but I'm here today to talk about kind of a little bit of work incentives, how you can access benefits planning if your agency or the agency that you're making a referral to doesn't have um, that service in place already. So the first question is why work? And I think that Lindsay really, really hit on a lot of the recovery aspects 
of employment uh, right off the top. You know, the improved social skills, the, the sense of community and purpose, um, having an identity, um, something to do with your time, all of these things are wonderful and they certainly contribute um, to somebody's recovery when they are living with a mental illness or a substance use issue. Um, on the other side, on the financial aspect, when we look at benefits, um, approximately 28% of SSDI only beneficiaries are living below the federal poverty level. So that's a pretty big chunk. And we know that the uh, amount of SSDI that somebody may receive is based, or another Title uh, II benefit, is based on the amount that either they have worked in the past and paid into the system or that a family member has worked into the past and paid into the system if they're a DAC or a DWB beneficiary. I have seen uh, pretty significant Title II payment amounts, but in my anecdotal experience, most of them are kind of maybe just hovering around the federal poverty level, maybe just below or just above. Um, so even if they don't meet that, uh, that actual cutoff, they're still not really um, in a situation where they have any sort of discretionary income or they are you know, able to save and plan for the future. Um, the federal poverty level for 2021 is $12,880 a year, which actually works out to about $1,074 a month. So again, we're just right there. 53% um, are between 100% of the federal poverty level, which is that 1,074, and then 300% of the federal poverty level, which in a lot of cases is still low enough to qualify for some other needs-based uh, benefits or entitlements. Um, so that's the Title II side. On the SSI side, we know that the maximum amount that somebody can receive as an individual right now in 2021 is 794 per month. So that is already just disgustingly below the federal poverty level, right? Um, as you guys have probably heard, because it was a pretty big deal, the amount of SSI that somebody can get uh, per month in 2022 is gonna go up to 840. That's the largest increase in about 40 years. So that's fantastic news, right? But it is still not enough. So from the context of helping people to apply for benefits, it may feel like, well, why do we want people to work? Why do we wanna risk their benefits when we work so hard to get on them in the first place? A standard social security application can take up to a couple years to get approved. And a SOAR application is of course much quicker, um, but it is very labor intensive. So why do we wanna risk this? This is one reason why. The financial ramifications of remaining on just benefits are essentially going to keep people at poverty. Um, these amounts generally don't increase much from year to year. As I said, this uh, coming year, we're gonna see the largest SSI increase uh, in 40 years and it's still nowhere near the federal poverty level. These amounts don't keep up with the cost of living and frankly, they're not designed to. Um, there is legislation in the works to change that, but who knows what will come of that. So a lot of times when we're talking with beneficiaries about you know, why they wanna go back to work, some of them will say, yeah, I wanna work or yes, I wanna work full time, but I'm really worried about my benefits and what's gonna happen. And that creates an artificial barrier to employment. Um, and as we know from Lindsay's presentation, work is recovery. And when we're creating a barrier to work, we're creating a barrier to recovery. So there are tons of myths about what happens when someone goes to work while they're on their benefits. So everybody has a story of, a, of hearsay, well, this happened to my friend or my uh, my grandma told me this, or I read this on a message board online, and even sometimes when people go into a social security office, or in the, these days call the social security office because you can't just walk in anymore, um, they may get information that isn't applicable to their individual situation because benefits counseling is a very individualized service. Um, so there's tons of myths and rumors out there. Uh, kind of piggybacking on that, like I said, it can be difficult to, to find a reliable source of information. We have these word of mouth stories, especially if you work uh, or if you're 
providing service in an agency that has multiple programs or where clients or beneficiaries can interact with each other. Um, I previously worked in programs where there were also um, day programs or day psychiatric rehab programs attached to them. And people talk to each other, you know, well, oh, this is what happened to me when I started working with my benefits. So um, that can be, that can create again, more myths and um, this word of mouth that kind of scares people when they hear that something happened to somebody else, but they may not know the whole story. And benefits planning is highly individualized and complex. Um, Everybody's benefit situation is different. Uh, the work incentives that are available to each individual could be different. What is available to one person might not be available to somebody else, depending on which benefit they receive and how long they've been working. Um, so that kind of that right there highlights the need for individualized work incentives planning. And we're going to talk about how to access that um, in just a little bit. So I want to go over the very basics, like. This is the absolute basic. This is fall on the East Coast right now. Like this is me in Uggs drinking Starbucks, the most basic uh, definitions or um, explanations of what can happen with somebody's benefits when they work. Um, if they are an SSI beneficiary, SSI is a needs-based benefit. So somebody has to demonstrate that they need the benefit because they don't have any other income or resources to support themselves. By that logic, it makes sense that the more money someone makes, the smaller their benefit check will be. So I always think of it like a scale or a seesaw where the heavier the paycheck side is, the lighter the SSI side is going to be. The way the formula is set up, somebody will always have more money by having a job than just by receiving SSI alone. So even though their SSI check may go down, they will still have more money in the long run. Title II benefits or SSDI, on the other hand, is very, it's all or nothing. You may have heard of the cash cliff associated with SSDI benefits. It's all or nothing depending on a couple factors. Um, the length of time that somebody has been working, so whether they've been working longer than nine months, um, and how much money they are earning, whether it's more than what Social Security refers to as substantial gainful activity or SGA. Um, that is basically the amount that Social Security kind of determines is what somebody can, or, or substantial enough for somebody to support themselves on. If you are earning more than 1310 in a lot of cases um, as an SSDI beneficiary, uh, you can then support yourself and that would replace your benefit. And that may or may not always be the case. So I'm going to break it down just a little bit more. Um, again, SSI is like a seesaw or a scale. When one side goes up, the other goes down. The more money that is earned from working, the less the SSI check is going to be. Because of the way that the calculation is set up, again, I want to stress, beneficiaries will always have more money by working. It is not a dollar for dollar offset. Um, the way that the formula is set up, it is actually about a $1 offset for every $2 earned. That's the, the simplest way of explaining the calculation. There's of course more that goes into it than that. But if social security is only reducing SSI by about $1 for about every $2 earned, you can understand how it would work out that somebody would have more money by working than by receiving SSI only. Um, something that I wanna stress because I wish I had a dollar for every time somebody asked me or said, well, I can work up to 20 hours a week and still keep my benefit check, right? Um, the number of hours or months worked doesn't really matter. Uh, it matters how much money somebody is earning. So here in Maryland, our minimum wage is almost $15 an hour. Um, where, whereas the federal, federal, excuse me, federal minimum wage is, I believe it's still $7.25. So someone who is working 20 hours a week at $7.25 is going to earn a lot less money than someone who is working 20 hours a week at nearly $15 an hour. And that person who is working 20 hours a week at $15 an hour is going to see a much bigger impact on their SSI check and their total income than somebody who is working 50, uh, 20 hours a week at $7.25 an hour. So 
if you had in your head that the number of hours was the, the key factor for uh, when somebody's benefits will be impacted by work, just forget it, just erase it out of your mind. Remember, it's how much money somebody earns. Um, a lot of times people maybe not ne aren't necessarily concerned also about their SSI um, because you know if they're get, having more money by working, then it's they're better off financially, but they know that they need to keep their health insurance because their health insurance enables them to continue to have their services. Um, here in Maryland, supported employment services are funded by Medicaid. I imagine it's like that in a lot of states. Um, Medicaid you know, pays for doctor's visits, um, prescriptions and that sort of thing. So there's a concern that if somebody were to lose their SSI from work and lose their Medicaid, well, that's fine if I don't have my check anymore, but I need my health insurance because I have to be able to have my services and I have to be able to take my meds in order to be successful in employment, right? So Social Security actually gets that. And they added a provision where if somebody is working enough that their SSI benefit stops entirely, they can still keep their medical assistance through 1619B. 1619B is just the name of the provision in Social Security's rule book. Um, but the idea is that they can still keep their medical assist, uh, their Medicaid, sorry, Marilyn, we call it medical assistance. Um, they can still keep their Medicaid. And there's no time limit on how long they can keep their Medicaid as long as they meet some uh, basic eligibility criteria, such as still, uh, meeting Social Security's definition for disability. Um, there is an income cap for um, how long somebody can, or the amount that somebody can earn and still keep their Medicaid through 1619B. It actually varies by state. Um, in Maryland, ours is about $41,000. So somebody can earn up to $41,000 and still be able to keep their medical assistance or their Medicaid, excuse me. So that's SSI. To switch over and talk about the Title II benefits or SSDI, um, DAC or DWB, uh, rather than being uh, like a seesaw, um, I mentioned previously that Title II benefits are more the cash cliff. Um, depending on how long somebody has worked. And the reason why we say that is because when somebody first starts working and they receive a Title II benefit, they have nine months where they can have unlimited earnings and they would still keep their SSDI check. The point of the trial work period is exactly what it sounds like. It's the time to try out working without fear of something happening to that check. So, um, if you are working with somebody who is maybe on the fence, like, oh, I kind of want to work full time because I really like having something to do with my time, their trial work period is the time to do that because they know they can try it out and see if they're able to manage that um, with other commitments and family and their mental health, any other conditions they have, um, and they wouldn't have to worry about their check being uh, suspended at that point. So that's nine months. After those nine months are up, somebody would go into what's known as the extended period of eligibility. And at this point, the SSDI or the other Title II benefit is like a light switch or a faucet. I referenced F, uh, SGA earlier, substantial gainful activity. This is the period in which this map, the SGA matters. So after the nine months, um, a Title II beneficiary would have their earnings compared to that year's SGA amount, which in 2021 is 1310. I think it's going to be 1350 in 2022. I was so excited over the increase in SSI. I didn't really even look at the 2022 amount for uh, SGA yet. But um, so if somebody is within their extended period of eligibility in 2021, if they are earning more than 1310 per month, their SSI would turn, or excuse me, their SSDI would turn off for that month. If the following month their earnings go below 1310, their SSDI could turn back on. It's like a, like a light switch or a faucet. I always use retail as an example. We're getting into the holiday season. Maybe somebody really want, they work at Amazon. There's going to be a ton more packages to deliver. We know there's supply chain issues and all that. So they're going to be super busy. And Amazon needs them to work 40 hours a week in November and December. Um, so maybe they earn $2,000 a month in November and December. 
um, that amount would be more than the 1310. So their faucet would switch off and they would have their paycheck, but they wouldn't be due their SSDI check. Then January comes around and um, they're tired. They need a break. Amazon's like, that's cool because we don't have as many hours to give out right now anyway. So maybe for January and February, that individual only earns $500 a month. If they're in their extended period of eligibility, that faucet or light switch can turn back on and they could receive their SSDI check for those months. So during the extended period of eligibility, which is three years, I don't know if I mentioned that already, it's three years long after the trial work period, somebody's, um, S uh, their SSDI can kind of turn on and off. This prevents people from having to worry about whether their benefit is going to be terminated or not, and if they would have to go through a whole application process. During the extended period of eligibility, their benefit's just suspended, and it can easily turn on and off depending on how much money they're making. Again, I want to make sure that um, everybody is kind of clear on this. It doesn't matter how many hours somebody works, only how much money somebody is making. So again, somebody making close to $15 an hour working 20 hours a week is going to be uh, just around 1310 actually. And somebody who is making 725 an hour uh, working 20 hours a week is probably going to be below SGA. That's math in my head, social worker math. Um, we know that Medicare comes with Title II benefits. So similar to Medicaid, if the SSDI is stopped due to work, uh, beneficiaries can continue to keep their Medicare for at least 93 months, which is seven years and nine months after the end of the trial work period. So they can keep uh, their Medicare for close to eight years. Um, in some cases, it's possible that people can keep their Medicare longer than that. It actually would depend on the when the first time they go over SGA is, but only Social Security can make a determination that it's longer than 93 months. So we always tell people that it can be at least 93 months. So the uh, extended period of Medicare coverage does have a time limit on it, whereas the uh, Medicaid coverage has an income cap. Um, so that's a, a good way to distinguish the two of those. So all this is very complicated to understand, right? I just went over the very basics and it probably still doesn't totally make sense. Um, and that's okay. Social Security has developed a couple programs um, and resources where people can get this information, especially beneficiaries can get this information to help them make decisions when they are returning to work. So the first one is the Work Incentives Planning and Assistance Program, or you've probably heard it referred to as WIPA. Um, the WIPA program is designed to be a source of accurate, individualized information for beneficiaries who are interested in working. So they would contact the WIPA project, they would do, the WIPA project would gather some information, verify their benefits, and then they could provide them with information about what that person can expect to happen with their benefits once they start to work. Um, this program is funded by Social Security, so they fund providers across the country, <coughs> excuse me, um, to provide this education and assistance to beneficiaries. And again, the information can include an in-depth summary and analysis, um, assistance with applying work incentives, information about Medicaid and Medicare, uh, they can do referral to other supports and um, inf uh, provide information about resources and that sort of thing. So the other one, the, the other big resource that uh, Social Security started um, to try to help get benefits information out there and to encourage beneficiaries to work is the Ticket to Work program, which is, uh, I, I work in a, well, one of the programs that I oversee as an employment network through the Ticket to Work program. So Ticket to Work was designed to reduce and whenever possible, eliminate dependence on cash benefits. Um, again, you may balk at the idea of like, oh, why are we going to reduce or eliminate? Well, we know that the reason why is because if somebody is receiving solely just their benefits, they are probably hovering right around that federal poverty level. So the Social Security uh, Administration started Ticket to Work. Uh, the goal is to help people between the ages of 18 and 64 who are on benefits get the services that they need in order to find a job and stay employed. So to be eligible for tickets, somebody has to be at least 18, 
uh, receiving their benefit as an adult. So if they're SSI, they would have had to have their age 18 redetermination. And they have to be under the age of 80, uh, 64, excuse me. So nobody who's like around that retirement age. Um, to implement the ticket program, Social Security sets up agreements with agencies all around the country. It's in all 50 states to provide the employment services. Uh, they call us employment networks, hence the Maryland Employment Network. And the employment networks provide services like uh, career guidance, job placement, job coaching, and benefits counseling. Because it stands to reason that if somebody is going to work, especially work at a level that may reduce or eliminate their dependence on their benefits, they have to understand the process of what that is going to look like. So ongoing benefits counseling is super important there. Um, to receive services, beneficiaries assign their ticket, that's the terminology or the lingo that we use, um, to the employment network of their choosing. And there are employment networks across the country. Um, some work in multiple states or even in every state. Um, some only work in certain zip codes. Ours work, we, we operate just in Maryland, um, but I know of many national ones. And then there are some that operate on like hyper-local levels as well. So um, the goals of the program, again, we wanna increase the number of beneficiaries entering the workforce. Uh, we wanna reduce the dependence on cash benefits because remember that, you know, was it 53% of SSDI only beneficiaries or between 100 and 300% of the federal poverty level. And by definition, anybody receiving just SSI is well below the federal poverty level. So we wanna support an improved quality of life um, as a result of advancement in employment and the greater financial independence. The greater financial independence, of course, is important as is all of the recovery aspects of employment that Lindsay already talked about. So how to get in touch with uh, either a WIPA project or an employment network if you're looking to connect, establish a relationship or make a referral. Um, the best way to do it is online. Social Security has set up um, a website there where you can search for the resources. So uh, I have a couple sc screen grabs, excuse me, here. Um, you go to choosework.ssa.gov. Um, and then at the top, you can see there's a couple tabs. And here we have the find help option circled. So if you're looking for employment networks or a WIPA project, first click on find help. Then you can do um, either a guided search where social security is, well, where the system is gonna ask a bunch of questions to help determine what they need. So maybe if you're not sure if your client could benefit from a WIPA project or an employment network, um, what they may need, you can do the guided search and the algorithm will help make that determination for you. Or you can do a direct search. If you know this person just needs a WIPA, this person just needs an employment network, so I just want to look for certain things, um, you can do the direct search that way. So this is what the screen looks like after you click on the find help tool. Um, here I have what the direct search looks like. So you can see first thing it's going to ask is the provider type, whether it's the um, employment network or vocational rehabilitation agency, a benefits counseling WIPA, or the legal services. Um, you can click on whether somebody wants in-person or virtual services. Um, a lot of employment networks do uh, one or the other or both. We are currently doing mostly uh, virtual, though in, when there's not a pandemic outside, uh, we also do in-person services. Some employment networks, a lot, especially a lot of national ones or ones that are operating in large states, may only do virtual or may do primarily virtual. Um, you can enter the, a zip code on a distance. Um, you can also click the uh, specific services that you're looking for. So if you know that you want an, um, an employment network that helps with ongoing job support or accommodations that you, this person that you're working with is definitely going to need an accommodation in the workplace, you can click that. Um, there had, uh, excuse me, there's a spot over here for Population serve. So if you're looking with, or if you're working with somebody with a vision impairment or a hearing impairment, and you know specifically that they are going to need um, a provider that can uh, accommodate that, you can click that. Um, check that off there. Languages, of course, and then specializations. So there are some 
employment networks that specialize in like the Tay population, some specialize in self-employment or veterans. Um, ours, we, we work with uh, people with any disability or any diagnoses, but we really do specialize in um, behavioral health. And then of course you can update your search results. Um, and I didn't have, I didn't go through an entire guided search, but here is the first screen kind of on the guided search page um, that basically explains that it'll go through 20 questions um, that kind of would help the, the software to figure out what the best match for um, services for the person that you are helping or that you are looking for could be. So if online isn't an option, and of course it, it may not be for everybody, of course. Um, there is also a hotline that, uh, or the, a helpline they call, they call it the Ticket to Work Helpline. Don't be confused by that. It's called the Ticket to Work Helpline, but it can also link you up with a WIPA project um, that operates from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time. And I have the phone number. I believe the slides have been put into the chat and, uh, or a couple of times um, and may get, may get sent out afterwards as well. So the phone numbers are here. Um, also, if you don't get a chance to grab it today, if you just type into Google Ticket to Work Helpline, you'll be able to find it. Um, and they do have a TTY number as well. So with that, I want to turn over to my colleague, Takia Blackman, and she is our peer uh, career and education specialist. I, I know, Takia, we just changed your title, so I hope I didn't butcher it too badly. <laughs> um, and, but she has some lived experience that she, I don't want to like do too much of an introduction because her story speaks for itself. So go ahead, Takia. Hello, hello, everyone. And as always, I'm excited to be here and to share my story. Um, so in about, I believe it was 2015 or 2016, um, I did attempt suicide and of course, I'm still here. So I survived. Um, I remember that day so vividly where I text a friend and I just told her like, I wish I wasn't here. And I remember at the time that friend did not know that I already attempted. Um, and I was just kind of waiting for the medication to kind of just, I thought maybe I would go on my sleep. Um, but the police did show up at my house and I was forced, of course, into the hospital because at that point I was a threat to myself. And so I actually started struggling with my mental health and like suicidal ideation at about 11 years old. And so I didn't get help into my early 20s. Um, and that's when I really became passionate about mental health. And so prior to that, I worked in the television industry doing like uh, event planning and public relations for television uh, networks. And while that great work was great and it was fulfilling, I really wanted to find a way to use my communications and media skills to really raise awareness for mental health. And so that's kind of what led me to the work that I'm doing with the mental health network, um, the mental health employment network, I'm sorry, Maryland employment network. <laughs> Um, and other things that I'm doing, like I've written a book on my recovery story. I've shared my story with thousands of individuals. Um, I've been featured on the news. I was a part of a campaign where my uh, picture was on a billboard in Times Square for a, a Remove the Mass Stigma campaign. And so I've been really able to do a lot by just simply sharing my story. It's very therapeutic to share my story because it allows me to remember how far I've come. Um, it's still not easy. Some days I, I still struggle, like in complete transparency, like even now I'm, you know, battling depression because of the loss of my younger sister uh, two months ago. So it's still very challenging. But one thing that I know is that when I share my story, it helps to reduce the stigma. It helps to encourage others who live with mental health challenges um, that their life matters, that you can thrive with the mental health condition. And for me, with um, getting to the point of really not being able to work um, at one point and um, having to give up my, uh, my apartment and all of that, 
um, that's really what led me to become a certified uh, peer recovery specialist. And so I've been able to work one-on-one -on -one with clients. I've been able to um, lead support groups. And people often tell me that um, after hearing my story, they feel um, encouraged or they feel inspired because it gives them something to look forward to. Um, you can go to the next slide, Kirsten. I actually don't have control anymore. Oh, you don't? Oh, oh okay. okay. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. So um, for me, like I said, uh, prior to being hospitalized, I was working um, for a television network. And um, I was missing deadlines. I had uh, public, re uh, public uh, I've had um, press releases that needed to be written or I was on a tight deadline and I was late to work all of the time. I couldn't concentrate. It would take me a very long time to complete a very small test. Um, I wasn't, of course, I was not able to take care of my hygiene. I felt hopeless and I was unemployed for two years or a little over two years. Um, because it has gotten that bad for me. Um, and one of the things that I've learned is that in my role as a peer support specialist, now my I'm kind of out there in the sense that because of the title that gives away that I have a mental health challenge or substance use challenge. Um, in my instance, it's not a substance use challenge, but I say all that to say that when you're a peer specialist, people know that you have some type of a, a mental health challenge. And so um, it's been very rewarding for me because I feel like I can show up as myself. I don't really have to worry about um, if, you know, if a employer's, if an employer will say like, oh, she's not reliable, she's not dependable because she has a mental health challenge. Um, I'm fortunate enough where I can, like I said, show up as myself. I can go to Kirsten and say, I remember last year where I was having a relapse and I had to go into a partial hospitalization uh, program and I was able to be very open and honest. And that's when I actually got the diagnosis of bipolar disorder when prior to that, it was just depression. Um, but I went to her and I was very open and honest and I was able to uh, get her support and kind of work. I was able to work around or have a flexible schedule to the point that I could take care of my mental health where previously I wasn't able to do that. I was so afraid because I thought people, um, it would be a judge of my character or my work ethic. You can go to the next slide. And so of course, eventually I returned to work. Um, I don't know how I have done it all or I'm doing it all. Um, my motivations was of course to rebuild my credit because when I was out of work, I depleted my savings, I couldn't pay my bills. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why I was like, okay, I have to go to work. My debt is increasing. Um, I also wanted to live independently because I was kind of couch surfing with um, different people. Um, and so since I technically didn't have a place of employment, technically I was homeless, even though I was staying with family members and friends. Uh, even at one point, just kind of feared that my car would be repossessed because I couldn't make the car payments on time. Um, but I did have family members who were able to step in and help me. Um, and then I also just wanted to travel, like uh, I wanted to travel more. And then of course COVID happened. So then <laughs> I wasn't able to travel as much, but um, just last month I was able to go to St. Croix, um, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and I was able to do that because um, because of employment um, and not just, I mean, I support the Mental Health Employment Network um, full-time, but part-time I also support uh, Shepherd Pratt. So I don't know how I'm doing it all, but um, I think what, what, encourages me is to is to be able to work with others um, to let them know that you know it is possible to work with the mental health challenge as long as you have the support like I still go to therapy um, I still see my psychiatrist um, I still have the support of my family members and friends and letting them know I need something when I'm struggling and so 
I realized that I, it does take a village to support me in my recovery. And I think the biggest thing for me is why I returned to work too, is I wanted to do work that felt uh, fulfilling. Um, it's one thing to just get up and just, just go to a job. For some people, that's fine. But for me, what drives me is feeling like I'm making a difference. Um, and that is very fulfilling uh, for me. You can go to the next slide. Oh, and I kind of uh, talked about all these things, but um, how employment has really helped my recovery. I now live alone. I have my own apartment. Um, I was able to travel. I'm a part of a community of peers um, in the state of Maryland. And then also I've been able to decrease uh, some of my debt and rebuild my credit score. And I am working towards uh, purchasing my first home. And I think, okay, yeah. So working in terms of financial independence, like my goal has always been to um, save for a rainy day or opportunity fund, um, build retirement, save for a home, travel, um, I worked with a financial coach for the past four years um, where she's been able to really help me understand my spending habits, um, how to increase my credit score and looking at my credit report, all those things that, um, that were impacted when I uh, had my mental health crisis. Uh, next slide. Oh, <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> And you're sticking to it. <laughs> Takia, thank you so much for sh sharing your experience um, with being a peer support specialist and your journey. And um, just really that message uh, that you and Kirsten shared about, you know, work is recovery and, um, and use, utilizing your supports, whether you're, they're your natural supports in the family and community or also financial planners and benefit planners and such to help you on your, um, on your journey. So we appreciate that. So much. So now we're going to ask our panelists um, to open back uh, your videos, and we're going to um, take some some questions. We're going to go into Q and A now. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to see if I can advance my slides to share some of our resources uh, that the TA Center um, has created um, uh, over the years. And it looks like I'm not actually able to advance. So thanks, Susie, for helping me out with that. And also thanks, a shout out to Dave um, in Alaska, who shared a couple of resources uh, in the Q&A, a link to our resources. We appreciate that. Um, so he, you can go to the SOAR website um, and check out some of the resources we create, recreated. This is a great one. Um, it really, Kirsten did a great job helping us with um, debunking some of those myths um, about returning to work and backing that up with some facts. Um, next, slide, please. I think we also share one of our conversation guides, which again, help you start that conversation um, can be really, really challenging. So we um, have some tips on helping you uh, do that. So uh, again, you can access all of these resources on our SOAR website and the link was again shared uh, below. My next slide, please. Again, more. Uh, these are some little cards and little handouts that we created uh, through our expert panel uh, that can really help, again, connect folks uh, to understanding, again, more about working and the impact on benefits and how, again, um, receiving income from employment um, can really help you, um, again, get out of poverty, help you in your recovery, um, et cetera. So check some of these resources. Next slide. And again, again, reach out, um, use, use our library, start that conversation about work early. I think that was mentioned in all of our presentations. Check out some of those, uh, these acronyms here, you know, find out who your local IPS teams are. Do you have it in your state? Those employment networks and WIPAs, et cetera. And again, some of the resources we shared can help you do that. And again, if you're kind of unsure where to go, reach out to your SAMHSA TA, TA Center liaison. We can help you, again, maybe understand a little bit about what your state um, is doing um, around uh, supported employment and utilizing Social Security's work incentives 
and such. Um, and I think our next slide is about our uh, evaluation. So at the very end, um, when you log off, you'll you'll get directed to an evaluation. So we ask that you kind of kindly complete that. That really helps us out a lot. So we're going to um, pull down the slides again. You can ask a question in our Q and A um, box here. We got some great questions in, um, so we do have some time to answer some of your questions. Um, kind of grouping up uh, a few questions that came in um, around just the overwhelming aspect of, of hearing about work incentives. And again, some of the questions came in before the panelists completed their presentation. So hopefully your question was answered. But again, one of the questions is, like, how do we learn more about this? Like, especially like in my state, how do I learn if we have an IPS program? Specifically, a question came in from Hawaii, Virginia, North Carolina. So maybe Kirsten, can you share a little bit about how can folks find out if there is IPS in their state? And maybe also how to get trained, how to become certified. What, what's that all about? Um, for benefits planning or for IPS? Oh, well, for IPS, is there IPS in my state? And then further, maybe how do I find out where my benefit planners are as well? Sure. So for IPS, there is the IPS learning community. Um, that is currently done through, and Lindsay, please feel free to jump in because I've actually been out of IPS for a couple of years now. Um, but there's the IPS learning community that is uh, currently done through Westat. So if you look up, um, you could probably put that just Westat and IPS into Google. Oh, go ahead, Lindsay. IPSworks.org. Yeah, there it is. Uh, you can find out that should have um, all of the states on the website that are a part of the learning community. Um, I would also check with your state VR agency to see if they can link you up with um, any IPS providers. If you're I'm um, familiar with your state VR agency. It's a government agency that provides funding and um, uh, resources for individuals with disabilities who are looking to go back to work. And it, it's set up a little bit differently in every state, but in our state, like in Maryland, it's a part of the Department of Education. Um, in terms of finding uh, the employment networks, so the WIPAs, I definitely would refer back to the slides on the Find Help uh, tool on the website or contact the Ticket to Work helpline. And if you are interested in becoming certified for benefits planning or um, to do that planning yourself, you could check out uh, Virginia Commonwealth University is the, um, the, the entity that provides the training for WEPA projects. So they do certification of benefits planners. Cornell University also does um, the certification for benefits planners. And there's a third one. I want to say it's Indiana State, but that one is relatively new. So I'll have to look into that one and get back on the third one. But I know for sure Virginia Commonwealth and Cornell University have trainings for um, benefits planners. Yeah, and some of our resources do does share information on um, Virginia Commonwealth and also Cornell as, as well, uh, but we'll make sure we um, include some of these resources as well. And then again, many questions came in about um, the Ticket to Work program, you know, overall, some folks are a little bit confused by Ticket to Work and hopefully by sharing some of those screen grabs about how to really access it online and then also getting the telephone number, should you not be able to get it online. Can you just very quickly, you know, talk about Ticket to Work? You know, what is it exactly? And what is the Social Security Administration's involvement with Ticket to Work? Sure. So um, Social Security kind of, they started the program. It was a part of the work incentive or uh, the work in, Ticket to Work and Work Incentives Act of 1999 uh, started the Ticket to Work program. And so basically Social Security outsources the services. Um, they contract with uh, agencies across the country. And these agencies provide employment support to beneficiaries. So if I'm a beneficiary and I am looking for a job, I may uh, go on the Choose Work website and find employment networks in my area and reach out to them to find, you know, reach out to a couple to find what's going to be a good fit for me. Um, once I decide what employment network I want to work with, I do the intake paperwork. I complete what's called an individualized work plan with the employment network. That's going to lay out what my goals are. And um, then the employment network is gonna help me meet those goals. So 
Um, if my goals are, you know, my short-term goal is to finish my degree um, so that I can achieve my long-term goal of becoming a child care provider, then that would be identified on the individual work plan. And the employment network is going to provide me services, you know, get me connected to education resources um, and help me get my child care certificates and that sort of thing so that I can then achieve my long term goal of becoming a child care provider. So the employment network provides and documents these services. Um, typically, an employment network will also provide ongoing services. So even once somebody becomes employed, um, they would not necessarily, you know, discharge or unassign someone from the program, they would continue to provide support to that individual to make sure that they're able to stay with their job, very similar to IPS. Um, and that the, if there's a situation where somebody says, well, I, I want to, I don't want to work at this job anymore. I'm going to switch jobs, or I want to go into a totally different field or something along those lines, then the employment network would provide that as well. The services are provided at no cost to the beneficiary. So that's super important. Um, it's funded by the Social Security Administration. Employment networks only get paid when beneficiaries are making progress towards working off of their benefits and are you know, achieving financial independence. So there is no cost to the beneficiary whatsoever. Social Security funds the entire program. Um, I think that is pretty much the gist of it. I don't know if there, if anybody has any more specific, like specific questions, I'm certainly happy to answer those as well, but that's kind of like the umbrella view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. I just wanted to address, address that a bit uh, since a few questions came in. And this is a question that I think, um, I think you can all maybe take a bite out of. Um, a question came in about employers and the very, um, just reading this question off uh, verbatim is, do you evaluate the employer's capacity slash willingness to deal with mental health issues? And I think we get the gist of that question. Is there education uh, to employers um, when you are doing job placement and the, whatever the disability may be, whether it's a mental health or an, another um, issue impairment the individual has, is there any type of education or what does the employer know about it? And what should they know or not know about it? And I don't know who wants to take that first, maybe Lindsay, how do you approach that? With IPS, um, disclosure is client driven. So whether or not the client wants us to have a relationship with the employer is gonna kind of drive that. However, we do build relationships with employers in the community. So we want to make sure that while we're building that relationship that we discuss, you know, even if we don't have a, a client to send them right now, we can discuss the the what what a typical one of our clients looks like and what typical um, accommodations that they might require. Um, and then once we get an employee or an employee that's working for them that that is open to disclosure, then we can work with the with the employer. So if the employer's like we're having this issue, you know, I don't really know how to handle this, where we sit down with the employee and the employer and kind of discuss what accommodations the employee might need and how we can implement that in the best way for the employer and the employee. So um, just in the relationship building part of it, there is kind of an educational aspect of it. But whenever, once we have a client that's employed with an employer, then we do that if at all possible. Yeah, I would, I would completely agree with that. Um, we definitely, uh, on the employment network side, we work to um, establish relationships with employers who may be willing to work with us. We also find that that helps just education in general really helps to reduce this overall idea of stigma within the community. So even if we don't ever end up with a individual that we work with being placed at a particular employer. At least we've provided this education to the employer um, since there are a lot of misconceptions um, and a lot of stigma out there. And we also do disclosure completely based on uh, client choice. I think most employment networks probably do that since it is a very personal decision um, whether or not somebody wants to let their employer know that they are living with a behavioral health or substance use condition. Um, we have a position within our employment network called the, our self-sufficiency development specialist. And she is really 
Uh, she's done a lot to engage local chambers of commerce and that sort of thing. Um, she's created diversity inclusion roundtables um, to try to just educate the business community on um, hiring people with disabilities and working with providers like employment networks and IPS providers and that sort of thing. So um, it's a work in progress. <laughs> Sure. Um, thank you uh, for adding on to that. Oh, we also had many comments, not necessarily questions, but a lot of folks are thanking Takia for sharing her inspiring story. And also uh, Takia shared a link to the book that she talked about. So hopefully folks can access that and take a look at that. So I just wanted to um, let Takia know um, if she can't see herself, how many <laughs> folks are thanking her uh, for sharing her story. Um, and some folks are asking, uh, because Lindsay talked about education, uh, folks accessing not just work, but education, how to get back to school, finish up their education, take it as far as they can go. Uh, how do folks access resources around education? Lindsay, do you want to take a um, IPS, we, we don't have any like specific resources, just like here, we'll pay for you to go back to school. And um, we do work closely with DRS and vocational rehab. Um, so some clients qualify for funding through that. We help them with the FAFSA. We help them with, um, through the whole process. We also build relationships with the education providers in our area so that they will, you know, they can understand, you know, who we are, how we're helping, you know, how we can help potential students. Um, like here in, in my community, we have something called the University Center. And um, it provides uh, classes from several universities um, on a campus here in town. And I built a relationship with the admissions department there so that they, they know who I am. Whenever they see me helping a client, they might understand immediately that, you know, this client might need extra assistance and might need extra help in the financial aid department. And, you know, so um, we help them do that and then we help them follow up. So like I have a client who we get spend our sessions on Khan Academy, which is an on free online resource, working on um, math activities so that they're practicing their G for their GED. Um, and that's what their concern is. So that's how we're helping. And they think that that's the most helpful way. Um, so it's basically just support throughout the entire process and making sure that you know, we're experts on what's available in our community to help them find resources. And I just want to add one thing. I don't know if this is across the country or, um, but definitely checking your states in, in Maryland, uh, the community colleges do tuition waivers for people who receive disability or disability benefits. So um, they would communicate with the, I wanna say the financial aid office and the disability office, and then the individual would have their tuition waived, not any fees or anything like that, but that is of course a big chunk of money um, to have waived as well. So that is a, a resource that you can look into in your community. Excellent. And uh, maybe uh, Kirsten uh, can take this. A few questions of, again, a lot of questions. How can I access IPS in my state? And you may have kind of answered this, but again, uh, folks are still asking, asking um, is IPS in my state? And if not, how can I get it in my state? Or is there an alternative to IPS? Or how can I maybe promote getting IPS in my state if not already? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, if there is an IPS in your state, you may want to reach out to your behavioral health authority and um, and find out if if they can direct you in any way. And Lindsay, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on this. I, uh, there is a training process and that sort of thing involved in becoming an IPS program. And of course, there's uh, the meeting of the, sorry if you guys can hear my dog, um, working at home. Um, there is a training process and kind of like an onboarding, getting up and going, making sure that you're meeting the eight principles that Lindsay talked about. So it is kind of, and I know it is a time consuming uh, process. It's not something that happens overnight, but I would definitely recommend maybe starting with your behavioral health authority to see um, if they have any guidance on how it could be implemented in your state. All of the states are listed on the ipsworks.org website that I put in the chat. Um, and if your state does not have one, I would definitely, the Behavioral Health Authority is a great place to start or contact the IPS um, learning community personally and ask that question. Um, 
because the IPS program was already implemented whenever I started here at Grand Lake and, and Oklahoma has done a great job of rolling it out all the way across the state. Um, but all of that was done through our state department of mental health. Um, and I know that other states, that's not the way that it is, um, is that it's not always done through the state department of health. It's done through employment community centers and some different, there's a whole different structures. Um, but the IPS model um, is, it's, it's pretty flexible other than the, the eight principles. So um, definitely reach out to the IPS learning community. They're very helpful. Um, it's, it's available in 26 states in the United States and it's available in several countries internationally. So just reach out and see on their website whether it's available in your state. And if not, then get a hold of them. Great, thank you. Um, I think um, I think a question I, I'd like to pose to all of you is what is that one myth about uh, work that you would like to debunk right now? What is the, the myth that comes up each time that you need to either talk to a case manager or a family member, you know, or your client, for example? Like, what is that one myth that you would like to make sure that folks go away from understanding the fact <laughs> behind that myth? Is there one Very that good. pops out? <laughs> that I'm going to lose my check if I work. That is their big fear because that's been their lifeline for so long. Mm -hmm. I, I completely understand. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, want, I understand that's been their lifeline. They're a lot of them for most of their lives. So I understand that they're scared, um, but there are incentives for you to work and that those incentives can build you out of poverty. I would agree with that. The other just uh, myth that I hear, is, and this maybe isn't for necessarily from beneficiaries, but just the general is that people who have a mental health condition or substance use issue can't work. Um, that I would really, really enjoy if that went away forever. Because we know as professionals that people absolutely can work. Everybody can work. It's a matter of finding the right job. Right, right. Um, and, and I think you've all said in some way or another, uh, work is recovery. Um, and I think Takia, um, would you like to just close us out? Maybe is there a myth that you, when you work with folks that you kind of, the one that pops up maybe most often? Whoa, Kirsten stole my answer. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the biggest one I was going to say it's like I can't work and I mean I always tell people all the time like you may not be able to work as much as someone else giving you know the challenges or the restrictions that you may have but you can work for sure that's great Thanks for sharing that. And I think sometimes you hear that work, going back to work is gonna make my symptoms come back, make my symptoms worse. And I think we've shown um, and through some um, you know, research and just hearing stories that no, that is not, not the case. You know, Work can do so many things uh, to promote your recovery journey. And again, I just wanna thank you all for sharing your, um, you know, your expertise in benefits planning, um, individualized uh, placement and support. Uh, many folks are asking, what is IPS? And I think after this webinar, folks will have a better understanding of what IPS is all about and how to access this even within your own agency. Um, you know, that, that may be the first place to start. Do we have this at our own agency? Um, so starting from there, hopefully our resources have really helped uh, steer you in that right uh, direction. We have many questions that came in that really pertain to specific work incentives. So we're gonna give them all to Kirsten. Yeah, we're gonna, um, we're gonna definitely get to those questions. Uh, we'll answer them. Uh, we may send them to the panelists. We may be able to answer them ourselves at the TA Center, um, uh, but we'll, we'll get to your, your questions um, again. I just want to thank everyone, all of our panelists, uh, Lindsay Horn, who's not here, Lindsay Weber, uh, Kirsten Silver, and Takia Blackman for giving your time and creating such um, informative um, and inspiring uh, presentations. Um, so again, please take that uh, survey or the evaluation at the end of the webinar, and we really hope that you've all gotten some uh, great stuff. I know I've learned a lot. 
from this webinar. Uh, reach out to your TA center um, if you're interested more in this topic. We had some questions come up about how do I become SOAR certified? So definitely check out the SOAR website about our online course. Reach out to your TA center liaison in your state and we'll, we'll help give you the information that you need. So I just wanna thank again, everybody and have a great rest of your evening. Until the next time. Thanks right everyone. Now.